Coming up next on Tech News Weekly, it's me, Jason Howell, ringing in the new year. We do not have Micah sitting next to me at this table. He will return next week. But we've got Wayne Ma from The Information, who has information on Apple's AR VR headset. A lot of interesting details there. Sean Hollister from The Verge joins to talk a little bit about MagSafe coming to Android, if you can believe it. Edward Tian, who actually built a system to detect text that has been written by chat gpt it's called gpt zero and he tells us all about why he created that and finally i round out the show talking all about apple's ai narration play for audiobooks that and more next on tech news weekly podcasts you love from people you trust this, this is twit this is Tech News Weekly, episode 267, recorded Thursday, January 5th, 2023. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Shopify. Shopify makes it simple to sell to anyone from anywhere. This is possibility powered by Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period to take your business to the next level today. Visit shopify.com slash twit, all lowercase. And by Bitwarden. Get the password manager that offers a robust and cost-effective solution that can drastically increase your chances of staying safe online. Get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. Hello, welcome to Tech News Weekly. This is the show where every week we talk to people who are making and breaking the tech news. Normally it's a we, but today, it's just a me. I'm Jason Howell. Micah Sargent is out this week, hopefully enjoying a little bit of a break, extended break after the holiday that we had. And by the way, Happy New Year. Um, and we've got some really great interviews lined up for you today. So let's just d uh, dive right in. Apple, of course, we've been here, you know, Apple has been this player on the outskirts of AR and VR for quite a while. We've heard, we've, you know, heard that Apple's working on something. Details have been very scant. And uh, the industry itself, it's kind of an interesting time for AR and VR. It's kind of like, is it really a thing that, that you know, these companies need to continue investing in? Well, Apple apparently is and plans to release some hardware. And we've got some uh, extended details on that, thanks to a report on the information written by Wayne Ma, who joins me now. Welcome to the show, Wayne. Jason, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really happy that I could get you for a few minutes to talk about, uh, to, to, I don't know, reveal some information about this headset because it's been <laughs> so shrouded in mystery. And I think the, the question that I have before everything else is, by the time Apple brings out something, <laughs> Like, is it going to be too late? I mean, I feel like I feel like there's so much uncertainty around, like, if, you know, AR and VR deserves all of the attention that it's gotten in the past few years. Well, if you think about it, Apple usually isn't a first mover, right? They yeah. just sort of sit on the sidelines and wait for other people to kind of do it first. So, you know, the smartphone, the personal computer, even the iPod, right? Mm -hmm. that Those weren't the first, you know, digital MP3 players or smartphones to come out. And so I think that, you know, based on, you know, my reporting on the technologies that are in this headset, you know, they're still far beyond, you know, what's currently on the market now. You know, they can, they can afford to wait and kind of uh, take their time on this. No question they're ahead of some of the technologies that are out on the market right now. Also ahead on the cost. I mean... Are we still looking at like a three thousand ish dollar uh, headset uh, setup? Yeah, that seems to be the case based on my you know talking to people who've worked on it. You know what yeah. they've heard, it's going to be pretty expensive. But that's also because it has all these new technologies that haven't been invented. Uh, that had to be invented for the headset. Yeah, no kidding. Well, let's start with the design aesthetic. Often, when I think of Apple and the things that you know I really appreciate about Apple's approach uh, to hardware, <laughs> is that they really do actually put a lot of thought and uh and uh time into how they how how things look and kind of the uh the operational aesthetic of the the design and how that integrates with the features and the functionality in there so what can you share that we didn't already know about kind of the design of this headset I mean, one of the big things is, you know, if you compare it to other AR VR headsets in the market, for example, uh, the most obvious being the Quest Pro, uh, the head, the actual battery for the headset is actually not in the headband. It's not integrated. You don't wear the battery. You are on your head. You, it's it's a it's like on your waist. It's a pack. It's uh, you connect it by a cable to the headset. Uh, I, you know, for me, that was a big shocker. You know, given Apple's penchant for you know cable-free designs. 
Yeah. So that's then on your hip. You've got the battery on your hip, not integrated in the headset. It sounds like this kind of went back and forth, which makes sense. I'm sure Apple has iterated a lot around this. Why then, why do you think that it ends up there? That seems like a step backwards when we're talking about what we've seen from other companies. And when I think about a hardware device that's uh, competing with, you know, th uh, devices that are a third of the cost, yet those devices seem more all in one versus this kind of like extended hardware detail. Why, why do you think that is? Is it just that it powers for longer or something else? I think it's both a design and practicality um, issue. Uh, I, you know, the headset has these really powerful processors, you know, they're very power hungry. So you need a big battery, but if you have a big yeah. battery, uh, you know, that battery can generate heat and get hot. It's also very heavy uh, and that weighs the headset down. Then you can't wear it for very long periods of time um, by having it uh, on, on, you know, by having it separate, you can swap it out easily. You know, if you want to, you know, use the headset for longer. Um, and I know that internally, um, you know, Johnny Ive was involved in the design of this, you know, he felt that uh, it was just way too constricting, you know, mm. uh, it was almost like, uh, you know, it was like very bulky and so forth. So it's both a design and I think practical aspect, you know, it makes the headset lighter so you can wear it for longer. Yeah. And I think the jury is really still out on, on how we feel about putting something on our head to begin with when it comes to technology. If we're putting something on our head and that's already a hill to a steep hill to climb. And then that's something that we're putting on our head is also very heavy considering the amount of power it needs to supply to everything to do all of these cool things. That's that's an even steeper hill to climb. So maybe, you know, it's a balancing act there. Not to mention, it really seems like this is a device that is not intended for consumers. Who do you think it's it's poised to be matched up with? Is this a total enterprise play? Well, that's a good question. I mean, uh, a lot of people want to compare it with the iPhone yeah. in terms of how revolutionary mm -hmm. they want it to be. But actually, people who have worked on it say it's more closer to the, the the Macintosh that came out in 1984. You know, when that computer came out, it was revolutionary. It brought the computer mouse to the mainstream. It brought graphical user interfaces, right, with you know, with Windows uh, and software to the mainstream. But it was twenty five hundred dollars in nineteen eighty four dollars. You know, mm -hmm. that's more than seventy seven thousand dollars now. Uh, but you know, gradually the Mac got more and more popular, and you know, defined the personal computer revolution. So I think that that's more of a comparison to this headset than the iPhone would be. Right. If we're 20 years ahead, what, what does it look like 20 years from now? I don't even know. Uh, but I guess we didn't even know then what things would look like now. So that's just the way it all works. Um, you wrote a little bit about uh, the motorized system for the lenses, which really seems to be, I don't know, I, which I can totally respect the fact that when we're putting things on our eyes, not everyone's eyes are made the same. Uh, there's a whole lot of, you know, complications that that can arise. Talk a little bit about how this emphasizes flexibility for the people who might actually wear these lenses. Yeah, I mean, one of Apple's big things is, is uh, inclusion, right, diversity. Right. And so they want to be able to uh, have as many people as possible be able to use this headset. And so uh, one is um, it's very crucial that the lenses align directly, you know, correctly with your eyeballs. Uh, other devices like the Quest uh, like the Quest 2, for example, has only three settings, you know, three different eye distance settings. Mm -hmm. You're just stuck with those three, right? Um, so this one, you know, it's it's a motorized automatic system that adjusts it perfectly to your eyes. On top of that, they have eye cameras inside, at least one camera per eye, maybe two, and that's meant to detect, you know, your eyeball movement so they can, you know, accurately represent your gaze. And again, it's, you know, they I heard they may have, you know, more than one camera per eye, you know, just because of inclusive, inclusive, uh, inclusivity uh, purposes. And then are are those cameras based on what we know? And again, this is all, you know, this is all based on sources, right? We have no actual hardware to point out and say, see, this is, this is what they're doing. But, um, are those cameras that are looking inward also providing the information for the supposed screens on the outside that, that, uh, project kind of emotion and I don't know, are they projecting eyes outward and to make things right, seem a little right. more human? Is that what that's supposed to be? Yeah, that's what I hear is that yeah. it's supposed to, you know, make you feel present with other people in the room, right? When you wear a VR, a VR <laughs> headset right now, or even an AR headset, you know, it's kind of isolating, right? People are in the room with you, but it sounds like you're in a totally different world than them, uh, you know, standing, even staying next to each other. And so I think that was a big thing with Apple is that they didn't want to make a device that was isolating like that. And that's why when they went with AR, not VR, uh, and uh, also they, I think this outward screen is also what convinced them that, you know, it could work and people would actually use it and be able to interact with other people. Oh man, in my mind, I just can't help but think that that's going to look really goofy. But then it's coming from a company who really spends their time making sure that they release a polished product that's going to be taken seriously. And so I can't imagine if they're doing that, I have to give them 
the credit that they probably deserve here to to be like, all right, I'm going to I'm going to withhold my judgment on that feature until I actually see how it's implemented. Maybe they will they will do it and I'll be like, OK, you pulled it off. But it sounds a little weird. Um, another thing you write a, a pretty you know a lot about is this idea of uh, latency and a number of different facets, a number of different ways that this headset is addressing latency. You've got the H2 chip, you've got this custom streaming codec. Um, talk a little bit about the importance of latency to Apple and, and getting that down, especially not to mention, you know, you wrote about the uh, integration with AirPods and communication. I mean, all of these things have the potential to introduce latency. And we know with, with VR uh, hardware, if you have latency, it, I mean, it can make you sick depending on how, how right. steep that is. Right, right. I mean, VR is a little easier than AR because you're not also trying to uh, project, uh, you know, the outside world in and sync that up with your movements. So yeah, AR, right. in particular, latency is very important. And so, you know, Apple has done a lot of things to address this. One is that they have a special chip uh, code named Bora that's only there to process the images from the headset, from the cameras, and stitch them together and, to, uh, and correct their point of view uh, for your eyes. So, you know, the cameras are not placed directly where your eyes are. Um, there, and uh, and on, on top of that, they would never be able to, because even if they're placed where your eyes are, they'd be a little bit too forward. And so uh, this is, you know, you know, they have this chip that's supposed to reduce like the time, the lag between like what you see in, in your movements. On top of that, um, yeah, it has to sync with uh, the main processor, which is the M2. Uh, mm -hmm. And so um, they had to build this like a uh, custom like kind of bridge between the two to, you know, speed up the conduit to speed up the communication. Uh, not just visual, but then you have audio too. Um, if you notice, uh, you know, the Quest 2 uh, from, you know, from Meta says that you're not supposed to use Bluetooth headphones with it. Mm -hmm. And that's because there's, you know, there's a delay in the audio between, uh, uh, between that, you know, it's just like too much of a delay. Uh, you know, they recommend wired headphones uh, where they plug into an audio jack or, or use the speakers on the, in the in the in the headband of the Quest 2. And, and Apple's the same way, except Apple won't have an audio jack. So what do you do? And so the solution they came up with was to um, uh, build in support for ultra low latency into the H2 chip, which is uh, used in the latest AirPods Pro uh, second generation. And probably, you know, I assume future AirPods that are going to come out uh, will have the same chip. And so there's an H2 chip in the headset and an H2 chip uh, in these new AirPods, and that's supposed to enable this ultra low latency mode as well. Of course, Apple doesn't uh, historically doesn't like. Uh, well, at least it's the joke. Don't like buttons. Don't like cables. You know, all you know, going more and more down this road of wireless. All so it doesn't surprise me, but it is a little strange. You know, that the, the uh, reliance on on wireless for audio. I'm also an audio, you know, an audio, uh, I love audio. So that thing again is, is one of those facets that yeah. man, I it just, I mean, me again, sick. there's also audio in the headband, uh, as well, you know, yeah. they're going to sell. So, uh, but you know, if, if you're going to communicate with people, uh, you know, do like tele teleconferencing or telepresence, you know, communication, I think there's some debate internally, like, should you just, should they require headphones because otherwise people can hear the yeah. conversation, you know? speakers in the headband right noise cancellation uh you know from the audio that's coming out of a speaker into a room and then back through uh not always that great but again i'll give uh, uh, apple the benefit of the doubt and uh it all remains to be seen so many more details that folks need to check out we really scratched the surface but we only have a short amount of time with you so i want to thank you for joining us wayne ma writes for the information of course you can find his work on the information if people want to follow you online are you on Mastodon these days? Twitter, where can people find you? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm on Twitter. It's at Wayne Ma. You know, just my first and last name, one word. Right on. Wayne, thank you so much for carving some time and Happy New Year. No worries. Thanks so much for having me. All right. All right. Coming up, we've got Apple opening the doors for MagSafe uh, for Android, which is really interesting. Going to talk with Sean Hollister from The Verge about that. But first, let's take a moment and thank the sponsor of this episode, Tech News Weekly. It's brought to you by Shopify. If you hear that, well, that's your sign. This year, forget about those run-of-the-mill solutions. Instead, start your own New Year's revolution. This is the sound to start selling on Shopify. If you've got a business and you want to sell, Shopify is the way to go. Shopify is the e-commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. Every minute, new sellers around the world are revolutionizing their businesses and making their first sales 
with Shopify. And what's incredible about Shopify is no matter how big you want to grow, Shopify is actually there to empower you with the confidence and control to take your business to the next level. So whether you're selling, you know, succulents or maybe you're selling stilettos, Shopify simplifies selling online and in person so you can focus on successfully growing your business. Now, Shopify covers every sales channel you know, in-person point of sale system, all the way to all in one e-commerce platforms. It even lets you sell across uh, social media marketplaces. So think TikTok, Facebook, Instagram. So many people are looking to buy on those platforms. It's packed with industry leading tools ready to ignite your growth. And Shopify gives you complete control over your business and your brand without having to learn any new skills in design or code. And when it comes to marketing your stuff, Shopify really is the best solution out there. You know, I've had friends who've had Shopify and use Shopify to help them get their art out in the world. And it was a piece of cake for them. They loved it. Do you want marketing made simple? Well, Shopify removes the guesswork with built-in tools that help you create, execute, and analyze your online marketing campaigns. And you can actually customize your online store to your style. You can connect with new customers to drive growth, even maintain the relationships that will keep them coming back no matter how big you want to grow. Shopify grows with your business, in fact, no matter how far or how big you grow, thanks to 24-7 help an extensive business course library, an endless list of integrations and third-party apps, really anything you can think of from on-demand uh, on printing uh, to accounting to even chatbots. Shopify is there to support your success every step of the way so you can grow and grow and grow. And now it's your turn to get serious about selling and uh, try Shopify today for yourself. This is possibility and it's powered by Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash twit. That's all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash twit, and you can take your business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash twit. And we thank Shopify for their support of Tech News Weekly. All right, this story was one coming back uh, from the break that I, I don't know that I really expected to see in my feeds. We talked about it a little bit on All About Android on Tuesday, but I definitely wanted to dive a little deeper on it. Wireless charging has, in my opinion, inched closer and closer to kind of table stakes, especially for premium devices uh, in, in the world of Android and, of course, iPhone. Uh, but up until now, it's missed something that iPhones have had for years. MagSafe, right? You've heard of MagSafe. That's the, the magnet that snaps to the phone. So it aligns the charging and, you know, it opens the door for a whole host of other accessories that are related. Looks like this is about to change. And joining me audio only for this interview is Sean Hollister, who wrote about the new Qi 2 wireless charging standard uh, that we heard about earlier this week. Welcome back to the show, Sean. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to get you back. I'm so happy to have you here for a few minutes to talk about Qi 2. So first, uh, maybe we start with the spec itself. And the one piece of confusion that I have about this announcement is there's wireless charging and then there's magnet. The Qi 2 spec, it's, is it really, is it an integration of both of those things or is the Qi 2 spec... Uh, the wireless charging component of this and the magnet is somewhat separate. Yeah, the funny thing about this, and I think why everybody is excited is because the new standard is essentially Apple's MagSafe. But that makes a lot of sense if you think about what Apple's MagSafe actually is. Apple's MagSafe was just Qi plus magnets. It's really that simple. Um, the Qi standard had already had an extended power profile in it that could allow devices to authenticate and do up to 15 watts of power, which is what Apple's MagSafe offered when it was introduced with the latest iPhones. Uh, but what was missing was the other kind of magnet. We call wireless charging magnetic charging. It's interchangeable because it uses magnets to create an oscillating field between the coils to transfer the power. But the other magnets that are integral to MagSafe are ones that just hold chargers and other accessories onto the back of your phone. And so what the Qi standards body, which is called the Wireless Power Consortium, is doing here is they're basically just adding the array of magnets. So Apple's, you know, you know, if you have this, if you have 
a bunch of magnets inside of your phone, inside of your accessory that are arranged in a certain pattern. We know that when you place this charging pad on the phone, it will align the coils properly. It'll sync up and it'll start charging nicely. And then we feel comfortable sending 15 watts of power or possibly more in the future over that connection. That's something that was not a given with Qi, but was a given with MagSafe. And now it will become a given with Qi too as well. Interesting. Okay, so it really is kind of the uh, kind of the, the the mixture of the two. Considering, yeah, because duh, that's this is how wireless charging actually happens with the power of magnets. But then you've also got the magnets to really kind of hold it into place. Which, I mean, I've certainly had the experience where I throw my wireless charging device onto the the you know the little platform, the wireless charging platform pretty certain that everything is great. Wake up the next morning. I've got 15% of my phone and dang it, it didn't line up. I've never lived a life where these things really snap into place out, outside of the, you know, the occasional like uh, smartwatch that happens to magnetically snap onto the tiny little puck. I just don't really wear a smartwatch very often. Um, is, are you an Android or iPhone user? <laughs> I hope that's not. Yes, yes. And, and have no, you no, used I, MagSafe I, I and am, has it both. changed your life? <laughs> Uh, so, so I've been trying to do the wireless charging thing for a very long time now. And, and like you, it's been hit or miss for me. Uh, I would say that MagSafe didn't necessarily fix that, though, for a couple of reasons. So, yes, I had the original Samsung chargers. Uh, just, just as a background, there was a wireless charging war with different standards bodies for a long time. But things have really coalesced ever since Samsung in 2015 made it a standard on all its flagship phones. And since 2017, when Apple made it the standard on theirs, it's been the universal way to charge a phone since basically 2017, uh, as long as it's a flagship device. Because uh, even though there's the Lightning versus USB uh, fight there between Apple and Android devices, the Qi standard has been the one way to do that universally uh, but magnets yes when the when the devices aren't properly aligned you get that issue with the device just don't charge maybe you bump it in the night i think that's what happened to me some of the times i know i would put it down the charging pad i would see it light up yeah. but the next morning i'd wake up it wasn't there with magsafe i was hoping that would fix it but what i found with magsafe is apple's magsafe cables aren't very long and so i couldn't reach it up to my bed for use in beds sometimes i would Knock that off the side of my bed, too, and the, and the phone would fall off. With the MagSafe third-party accessories, there weren't very many of them. Uh, there weren't a lot of third-party charging MagSafe charging cables. There weren't a lot of MagSafe batteries and so on. And, and, the, and the MagSafe quote-unquote compatible ones that other companies did come out with had their own limitations. Sometimes the magnets wouldn't be strong enough to hold them onto the back of your phone. And sometimes um, they, would, they wouldn't be able to charge at full speed since Apple was limit the 15 watt fast quote unquote charging of MagSafe to devices that had the actual Apple puck inside of them. So a lot of things were keeping the MagSafe accessory ecosystem from catching on. And I don't think that worked for me that very well either. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that Qi 2 fixes it. And there are a couple reasons to think it might. And there are a couple of reasons to think it might not. All right. So you're setting me up. Yeah, that, that was a perfect setup. Uh, I would love, I mean, I think I can kind of understand why it might fix uh, address that problem, but I'm curious to hear because you definitely spend some time in your article talking about the good and the potentially not so good, which is very compelling on this. Uh, cause I, you know, as an Android user who hasn't really had this before, I'm totally looking at the upside and kind of excited about what that might mean. It might actually get me excited about wireless charging. Cause I just really, have been very blasé about it um, up until now. I still plug my phone in at night, even though I have a wireless charging puck by my bed. It's just, I, I, there's no question if I plug it in, I'm going to wake up in the morning and things are going to be good. So what are the good, what are the bad in your opinion? Okay, so the good is, is super easy. If, now I interviewed the Wireless Power Consortium spokesperson and if what they led to me to believe is true, what will happen is as simple as this future samsung phones and future apple phones will all have this chi2 certification and you will be able to take a single charger that has a chi2 certification manufactured by anyone who gets their charger certified snap it onto the back of either kind of phone and it will just work the Sounds magnets nice. will give you the right alignment it'll snap together you'll get your up to 15 watt charging speed 
and that's it just works i mean that sounds amazing i would love to have that so that okay so assuming that again assuming that both of these companies latch onto this like they should that will happen and that sounds amazing okay some wrinkles one wrinkle is the Cheese 2 certification does not use the exact same alignment of magnets to snap devices together as MagSafe. It may not be backwards compatible with iPhone 12, iPhone 13, iPhone 14, and possible, possibly mm. iPhone 15 devices that have MagSafe. So that charger, which it might work with future Apple phones and future Samsung phones, might not work with the iPhones that already have something very much like this. And that is mystifying to me. Why would they change the way the magnets work to exclude all these millions of devices? Now, it's not a guarantee that it will exclude them. The the spokesperson was a little bit, didn't want to speak on behalf of Apple as far as this goes. And it's possible that they'll be, that that while it's different, they might still latch together in some way. Maybe it just won't be as strong or maybe it just won't support as high power as they would like to send. For instance, today, you can buy an external battery pack that snaps right out of the back of your iPhone. And if you buy Apple's one, it charges it. You can charge your iPhone mini at 12 watts. It can charge your iPhone at 15 watts, maybe. Uh, If you buy one from Anchor, It'll, it'll charge at only 7.5 watts. Maybe there'll be some baseline like that where this Qi2 stuff works with MagSafe at a, at a baseline of 5 or 7.5 or 10 or 15 watts, but it won't let you go amazing places in the future with more wattage. Maybe that's where it's going. Okay. Another wrinkle is that Qi2 certified chargers will all need to have authentication. They will need to say, this is what I am and, I, and I'm doing this nice handshake with you in such a way that the device can say, yes, I will do that. I, you know, yes, I will take this energy from you. Or maybe the phone will say, no, I will not do that or I will not take as much energy from you. Right now, this is a thing that is largely optional in the Qi, sort of, uh, the Qi standard. The Qi standard says, if you want to send 15 watts, you have to authenticate. But if you want to send five watts, if you want to send less, you don't need to tell us anything. You just need to have the baseline in that, you know, you're sending some power. You can tell the device that you're sending the power and you need to be able to reject foreign objects like bits of metal that might create some problems. That's pretty much the baseline for Qi right now. And so to say that you're going to need authentication sounds great. It's going to it's going to open up these use cases. But it also means that devices can say no. An Apple device might be able to say, no, I don't want to charge from this device I don't recognize or that doesn't that didn't jump through these hoops or that isn't, you know, what I want it to be. I'm hoping that this simply means that it'll draw less power from some devices the way that Apple's devices do today. That makes sense to me. But it's possible that we won't have the Wild West ecosystem of magnetic accessories that's been coming out recently. And that's both good and bad. It's good if you want to make sure that things just work. But it's bad if you like the idea that just anybody can make a a product that uses magnets and electricity with your phone um, because there won't be quite as many players in the market anymore. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, so when are we going to start being able to answer some of these questions? Is it by the end of the year that we'll see products? Uh, I'm assuming this has to have buy-in from, I mean, you know, just talking about smartphones. And by the way, this isn't just smartphones that would benefit from this. There are other devices that would. But when you're talking about the sea of Android devices, will this require Android devices to uh, to release like qualified for Qi2? And then, of course, you know, the, the manufacturers of, of the actual products that are Qi2 enabled to snap into them. Is that happening by end of year? The idea is that it'll happen by end of year. Yes, the Wireless Power Consortium told me that they're trying to make this happen as soon as possible. They want to get this spec done because, again, this spec is just adding magnets to their existing electrical connections and some quality of life improvements, maybe. They want to move on to a next version of the spec that will also deliver more power. So they want to get this done fast. I don't know if that actually happens that quickly. Um, For one thing, there's going to be certification with Qi, but also, you know, some of these devices probably have to go through the FCC. That can always, uh, it can always take some time. Um, 
if they're far enough along, they could make it happen by the holidays. The other interesting thing about saying, um, as the WPC does, that these devices should be out this holiday season is that the holiday season doesn't necessarily line up with either of the big smartphone manufacturers, typical mm. release windows. We typically get new iPhones in what September, October, I suppose holiday season devices could include those, yeah. but um, Samsung's uh, usually announces its phones in what, February. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, doesn't quite line up with that either. It doesn't line up with either of the manufacturers. So I'm wondering if, if we're in this, in this state where um, maybe both of these companies have been quietly working on this for some time and you know, secretly working on it behind the scenes and they're already ready. They're just, they're just waiting for the spec to come out the same way that with Wi-Fi, you know, sometimes uh, cons uh, companies will come out with draft. A draft end was a big thing for Wi-Fi. All kinds of router manufacturers didn't wait for the spec to be done before they released their products based on the spec. The spec should be completed in the middle of this year. And so everybody should have some, some room to do that. But any member of the wireless power consortium, and that is a who's who's, a who's who of every major electronics company, they already know what's coming. They could have been building this for a while. Maybe they're just waiting until it's official before they announce their stuff. Interesting. All right. Well, I'm curious to see how this develops. It seems like maybe we've got some waiting to do as far as that's concerned, but um, I'm optimistic about what this might mean for MagSafe on Android. Still a little kind of curious about, you know, Apple's reasons and you do write about this, but we do have to move on. So I should uh, tell everyone to check out uh, Sean's article on The Verge to find out those reasons why Apple might be interested in opening this up uh, for other competitors out in the space. And Sean, I just want to thank you for uh, joining me today on the show if people want to find you online where can they find you yeah i'm uh, at sean hollister at mastodon.world there you go right on well thank you sean and best of luck and we'll talk to you soon take care happy new year all right up next i'm going to speak with a person who built you may have seen the news in the last few days built a tool to detect when text has been written by chat gpt had to know this was going to happen sometime and we've got uh the guy who did that but first this episode of tech news weekly is brought to you by bitwarden bitwarden has become one of my projects <laughs> recently because i'm actually transitioning from LastPass to bitwarden for reasons you probably already know of but bitwarden aside from all of that bitwarden is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home at work on the go it's trusted by millions with bitwarden you can securely store credentials across personal and business worlds january 22nd through the 28th is data privacy week Leading up to Data Privacy Day, in fact, Bitwarden would like to remind everyone that your data is valuable. It's very valuable. And so is your privacy. You need to know that. All of your data in your Bitwarden vault is end-to-end -end encrypted, not just your passwords. And Bitwarden doesn't track your data in the mobile apps, only crash reporting. And even that is removed in the F-Droid installation. So you can find that. Bitwarden is open source, literally invites anyone to review library implementations at any time on GitHub and also to review the Bitwarden privacy policies at bitwarden.com slash privacy. So you can really look in there and see what's going on behind the scenes. Protect your personal data and privacy with Bitwarden by adding security to your passwords with strong, randomly generated passwords for every account. Super important. Go a step further with the username generator and create unique usernames for every account as well. That can makes it even more, uh, more protected. Uh, even use any of the five integrated email alias services offered. Bitwarden offers email alias generation with simple login, Anon Addy, Firefox Relay, Fastmail, and now DuckDuckGo. These services are going to allow you uh, to create a masked email address, one that you could use for only one website, in, in fact, and forwards any emails to your primary email account from there. This keeps your main email address out of the databases of the services and sites that you're signing up for, making you even more protected. Bitwarden is a must need for your business as well. It's fully customizable. It adapts to your business needs. Their team's organization option is only $3 a month per user. Their enterprise organization plan is $5 a month per user. And you can share private data securely with coworkers across departments or the entire company. 
And if you're just an individual, don't worry, Bitwarden has you covered. You can use their basic free account forever, free for an unlimited number of passwords or upgrade at any time to their premium account. And premium, that's just less than a dollar a month when you do the math, which is crazy for the features you get there as well. And then there's the family organization option, which gives up to six users premium features for only $3.33 a month total. At Twit, we are fans of password managers. Bitwarden is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home, on the go, or at work, and is trusted by millions of individuals, teams, and organizations worldwide. Get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan, or you can get started for free across all devices as an individual user at Bitwarden dot com slash twit that's bitwarden b-i-t-w-a-r-d-e-n bitwarden.com slash twit and we thank bitwarden for their support of tech news weekly all right so anyone following uh the tech trends of 2022 and actually watching this show because we've talked about it so many times in many different episodes notice that artificial intelligence is seeing incredible growth right now. Things grabbing the most headlines were tools like Stable Diffusion, uh, also ChatGPT. ChatGPT just seemed to like explode uh, it, uh, people's kind of imaginations around what AI is capable of. It's, you know, both of those tools together. It was like, whoa, what what is this world that we're heading into? Um, and it, it's just what it's churning out is very convincing, so much so that there are a lot of people that are very concerned about the impact of tools like this. And in particular with chat, chat GPT, what is the impact that it could have on education? Well, joining me is someone who seems to have had a similar concern or at least uh, you know, thought what, what uh, could be done uh, potentially. It might be beneficial to be able to detect when something has been written by chat GPT. And there are probably many different directions that a tool like that could be very useful. And uh, so I'm happy to welcome to the show Edward Tian, uh, the creator of GPT-Zero.me, a tool that does just that. It's great to have you here, Edward. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jason. Great to be here. Awesome. So let's start with um, kind of the impetus around this. You tweeted a few days ago that you spent your New Year's creating this tool. Happy New Year. Uh, before we get into what it does, what was your motivation? Why Why did you spend your New Year's uh, working on such a thing? For sure. Uh, so first of all, like language models and machine learning for so long have been notorious for being black boxes where we don't know what's going on inside. And with GPT-0, I just wanted to start pushing back against that and start fighting against that. Um, and the other really like ethos towards building this is like transparency. Transparency was top of mind. It was like critically important to me that, you know, like it, the data in the app was actually like laid out. Everyone could see it and then everyone could use it because um, like, like humans deserve to know the truth of what is, you know, AI generated and what is machine generated. Uh, just like in like academia, there's academic integrity and journalism. Uh, there's journalistic integrity. I'm not opposed to, you know, AI technology being adopted. In fact, I think it is the future. AI is here to stay. But when using these technologies, there needs to be integri uh, integrity and a responsible adoption. No question. I completely agree with that, um, which is a, it's a it's it's a strange place to be on one hand, supporting the fact that technologies like this will exist. And then on the other hand, being very cautious about the impacts that they might have that we are aware of and that we aren't aware of quite yet. So um, it's a really important moment in time as we all get very excited about the potential. But also, you know, we got to pay attention to uh, the other impacts as well. Is chat GPT in your uh, experience? or in, in your view, already having this impact on the work of students in schools? Or, or was this more of something that you did to kind of get ahead of the curve? Because I know that I heard a lot of people, you know, as ChatGPT was really gaining steam just a couple of months ago, this was almost immediately the, the return was like, man, essays are going away. What are teachers going to do? Like there's, there's a lot of uh, fear and uncertainty about what the impacts could be here. Do you think we're already like... I, I guess it's more of a guess that you'd be making, but I'd be really surprised if students were already trying to use this for some of their work. What do you think? Yeah, I think for sure. Like we're, we're absolutely at an inflection point here, uh, but maybe we've been at this point for 
for like at, at least a year now, if not more. I remember my first like NLP natural language processing class that I took in university. You know, the professors, the professor started the class by putting two texts. One was machine generated and one was human generated and asking like everyone in the classroom, 100 students uh, to, you know, say which one was machine or human generated and the results were mixed. So we've been we've been at this inflection point um, for at least a year now, if not more. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. So uh, let's talk a little bit about your kind of your approach here. And we're actually showing a little video um, that you had tweeted out that that kind of illustrates a little bit of the process here, selecting text, pasting it into, you know, a field, um, getting a whole bunch of results that come out after the fact. How did you go about putting this together together? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a developer mind necessarily. I'm not a developer, but we do have a lot of people who are very highly technically minded, uh, who'd be interested in knowing kind of like what your, what your thought process was when you were tackling a tool like this. For sure. So, um, I built a uh, GPT zero out of a few sittings at my local coffee shop. Uh, this was not like a years of like a deep stealth project. Um, <laughs> although for the research, uh, in this field, I, I have been thinking about it for a really long time, um, whether it's, you know, this semester I was taking a graduate NLP course um, and I'm doing my uh, research with the Princeton NLP lab uh, where we're looking at implicit bias in AI generated text, whether there is something different in AI generated text that, uh, you know, like human uh, from that differentiates it from human text and vice versa. And I do believe like, uh, like, that is the case. Like big picture, there's there's something like beautiful about human prose, um, like emotions. There's there's something that machines can and should never co-op. And even when um, you pulled up that demo right there, uh, I tested it a lot with uh, John McPhee uh, was writing on the New Yorker, and um, Professor McPhee uh, was uh, has been teaching the same writing class for over forty years at Princeton. And I happened to take it the last year he, he taught it. He's he's over 90 now. And I remember just sitting in that class and seeing, wow, like writing can be so beautiful. And there, there's some things that like computers can never co op there. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, and I noticed in that video, uh, it the results or rather the detection of whether it was written by a human or written by a robot seemed to revolve about the, around this idea of perplexity that you indicate kind of in the walkthrough um, right. video that you showed off. What exactly is that? How did you know? And, and how does that indicate a human versus an AI in this case? For sure. So perplexity uh, is a measurement of randomness to a model or how random a model finds a text. So if a text is really perplexing, um, you know, it's really random. It's really perplexing. The model might not be very familiar with it. Then it will have high perplexity and it is likely to be human written. Uh, on the other hand, if, you know, a piece of text is very familiar to a model, maybe uh, the model has seen it in its training data set um, or it may be the model itself is very probable and very likely to generate such a text then it would have low perplexity and is more likely to be machine generated. Um, but uh, I do have to emphasize that perplexity itself is a very imperfect indicator because it does consider a host of other variables and factors such as text length. If the length of a text is longer, it's likely to be less random and thus have lower perplexity. So that's when burstiness comes into play. So burstiness is the big picture. Uh, indicator. So um, burstiness measures sort of the variance uh, in the text. So if you plot um, perplexity over a stretch of time, then you'll see that with human written articles, it'll vary and go all over the place. And it'll have sudden spikes, it'll go up and down. But with machine written articles, it will have sort of a baseline and will be consistent throughout. So that's sort of the big picture indicator. And I do like uh, like how uh, with this indicator, it's very transparent. Uh, so ultimately, I uh, the next step of GPT-0 is I don't want to tell you whether something is machine or human written. Maybe I want to give you uh, like a score yeah. of like uh, one to 10 and some nuanced analysis. But with something like, uh, like burstiness, you can see for yourself the variance in human writing versus the constant line in uh, 
computer writing. So you can make uh, the determination yourself as opposed to a machine telling you whether something is human written or machine written. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. And how so as as you were saying uh, just a few minutes ago, you know, this has been kind of a crazy, uh, crazy time for you because you, you put this out on New Year's. And then I think I saw your follow up tweet the next day. You're like, whoa, I had no idea this was going to take off the way it did. Obviously, people are interested in this because, you know, tools like these attempt to solve a big, you know, one of the one of the big problems that potentially AI has, which is how do we as humans know whether we're looking at the work of a human or a robot? And we kind of like we want to know that in some cases we need to know that. How are people responding yeah. to the tool um, it, since since you've released? It? Are they having good good success with it? What are, what are they saying? Yeah, for sure. So one, I was totally blown away. Uh, by the excitement it's generated, I expected maybe a few dozen people at best, you know, to try try this app I built up. But um, yeah, within within like so now over like fifteen thousand people and counting have tried out the beta as well as uh, so like yeah with the day the next morning when I woke up like yeah the the app uh, like was like oh wow there's too many people for the website host. Hosting. And actually, Streamlit, the hosting platform, had to like step in themselves. And they were they reached out to me, and they were so kind and generous, and they just basically bumped up the hosting and memory oh, um, nice. for free. Um, and there's just so much, yeah. There's just been like, yeah, so much momentum there. Um, like I've been uh, like like hearing from teachers from all over the world, from like Switzerland, France, uh, who have like reached out and um, said that wow this like they've been trying this it, it works sometimes it confirms suspicions they have uh, i've been hearing from admissions officers who have reached out saying this is like really interesting to them um you know i i heard from like the department chair of our computer science uh like uh, like school uh like yesterday too and she was like yeah like this is really cool like all the professors are talking about it so it's just i'm blown away by the excitement that's awesome. That makes me smile to hear that um, because like I said, it is a tool that I think a lot of people were hoping would exist and, and knew would exist at some point. I'm sure there are others, you know, in the works out there, but you're, you're really able to kind of capitalize off the fact, you know, that there aren't many that, that anyone really knows about quite yet. And uh, so it's, so it's very uh, heartening to know that people are putting it to work and, and seeing that it offers some sort of, uh, I don't know, some sort of peace in a situation where, you know, cause I I can imagine in schools like administrators teachers like there's got to be some sense of panic when when they're when you look at the power of a tool like chat gpt and the things that we don't know about what it's what it is capable of and 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 what what it will be a year to two years down the line at the same time there's the school of thought no pun intended that is like these tools will exist and instead of instead of putting limits and barriers and saying uh, we refuse to accept that these tools will exist, so here's all the things that we're going to put in its way, you know, is like how do you feel about the idea that like maybe if this is the future, if the if the, if the future uh, contains tools like these that broaden out you know, what is, what is possible with computers, then students need to learn and, and grow with them instead of against them. What are your thoughts there? Right. Yeah. Great, great question. So I really like what you said uh, about, you know, humans need to know the truth. In fact, we deserve to know the truth. I almost find this analogous to, you know, social media technology being built out uh, years ago. Uh, and we know now that there needs to be responsible safeguards for you know, responsible adoption. So it's uh, equal and fair to everyone. So everyone reaps the benefits of you know, uh, technological advancements and you know, no one is harmed by it. Uh, and just like in, in social media, we've seen things like fake news and disinformation campaigns. It's almost analogous here that AI is here to stay. You're absolutely right. In fact, I totally believe that it is the future, uh, you know, like, like, and I'm not opposed to anyone, uh, you know, using AI when it makes sense. Um, but at the same time, for actual mass adoption, for this technology to be normalized and to benefit everybody, there needs to be safeguards for responsible adoption. Uh, and that's sort of like the impetus here. You yeah. can't just release something into the world without, you know, uh, having these safeguards. 
Yeah, 100%. I, I totally agree. Well, Edward, uh, excellent job uh, creating a tool and and find, you know filling the need, especially on something that has such attention right now. Um, but it's it's really cool to see that uh, you know that we as as humans can like have an idea and sit down and be like oh, I'm just going to spend a couple of days and see what comes out of it and then on the other end of it you know to find so much um, so much positive attention around it and I guess the 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 really good news about that for you from for me looking on the outside looking in is that you're kind of at the beginning of this arc and you know of course you're going to sp- I'm assuming anyways you're going to spend time you know. Uh, modeling and, and, and iterating on this tool to make it better and better. So it's exciting to see where it's going. If people want to uh, check it out for themselves, they just go to GPT zero dot me. Is that what you want people to know as far as uh, using this tool? Thanks Jason. So yeah, GPT zero dot me. And uh, you're absolutely right. This is like the start of the NARC the next you know few weeks or the next few months. I'm just going to be like all in on building this out on yeah. improving the model on, you know, a building the new app on fully scaling. And um, if you want to follow the development of that, um, there's, you can go to gpd0.substack.com where I'm going to document my journey on just building this out. And yeah, I'm all in in this. Uh, it was incredibly exciting to see that people want to use it. So I'm going to put my time. Right. It's worth. right on as, as you should. That's really exciting. So, uh, good stuff, Edward. Thank you for hopping on and taking some time and best of luck. We'll definitely be watching. Thank you, Edward. All right. Uh, so we have, I have for the, for the last part of the show, actually for the last part of the show, I have a story that's very much a part of this whole discussion AI continues to crop up uh, time and time again. And earlier today, I saw the news that Apple quietly unveiled its next AI derived thing that we can all get excited about or, you know, fear, depending on how you feel about the whole robots taking jobs thing. Apple has worked with independent book publishers uh, to create a new project within its books app, something they call AI narration. And this, and this kind of strikes, you know, it hits home a little bit because we've joked so many times on the Twit Network about, oh, well, at some point AI is going to get so good that, you know, we won't we won't be able to podcast it or we won't need to podcast anymore. Like, well, let's just feed Leo's voice into AI. And at the end, of, on the other side, we're going to have a convincing Leo replica. Then it's just a matter of filling out podcast content. And hey, there you go. It's, it's AI podcasting. Not that AI podcasting doesn't already exist, but if you've checked it out right now, you know, it's very unconvincing, right? Like the voices kind of sound good, but it's not something that you would want to listen to week in, week out. So I think we're a long, long ways from that. But this has to do with audiobooks. All of the books in this catalog, uh, in the AI narration catalog within Apple's Books app, are being narrated, and this is a quote from the site, narrated by digital voice based on a human narrator. So they they have some samples, which we can get to in a second, but it sounds like they've trained their AIs to create you know, really polished AI narrator voices that have different personalities, different, uh, different inflections, that sort of thing. Um, and so that empowers authors to essentially offer their their novel, their book, whatever they have, their published work with an audiobook, whereas, you know, they might not have been able to do that other otherwise, you know, it's a, it's a lot of work. It can be an expensive endeavor. It takes a lot of time to create an audiobook version of a uh, above published work. Apple says many authors, and this is a quote, especially independent authors and those associated with small publishers aren't able to create audiobooks. Due to the complexity and the cost of production, Apple Books digital narration makes the creation of audiobooks more accessible to all, helping you meet the growing demand by making more books available for listeners to enjoy. So making more books available to listen to. I've certainly noticed, you know, the amount of books that come out now with audiobook narration uh, attached to it. And I'm very like, I appreciate that because I don't do a whole lot of read reading, but I do a lot of listening reading (laughs) in my life. Um, And it's a real bummer when I encounter that book that I can't listen to. Uh, I mean, because, you know, for better or for worse, 
I'm way less likely to, to find and make the time to sit down and read. I just am. Judge me. Whatever. There are a lot of people read. I, I don't really spend a lot of my time reading, but I do spend a lot of time listening to books while I'm doing other things. And I absolutely love it. It's just my preferred method. Um, so I love the idea of broadening out the books that are offered uh, in a way that I can listen to them. Having said that, I've tried the systems where I think Pocket is, uh, you know, that's an app that I use to store um, links from from websites and stuff. And I think Pocket has a way where you can have it read to you an article. So it's kind of like it's in it, it's very similar to this. And the whole process, it, like it just doesn't sound that great. Like it's it's choppy enough. You know, you're listening to a robot reading you an article and it's good in a pinch. But I couldn't imagine listening to a 13 hour book with that voice. I just I wouldn't last. Um, Apple's allows an Apple preferred partner to nominate their titles. Those are evaluated by Apple and qualified uh, from there uh, with plans to open up even further in if the future. So one could imagine somewhere down the line, an independent author, you know, becomes a preferred partner or maybe at some point doesn't submits their book and says, Hey, I want to qualify for this. Apple does their, you know, qualification, uh, methods on the other side and then says, okay. And boom, you've got a, your audiobook offered to everyone with a whole lot of less, um, you know, to do to make that happen. The publisher or the author still retains audiobook rights. So that means they can still choose to produce another version of the audiobook if they choose. I think that's really, uh, really important. That makes me think that maybe this would be a good stopgap measure. Like I've got a book, I don't have the budget or I don't have the time or I don't even know if there's demand for an audiobook version of this right now, but I'm going to do this and see how it goes. And then if that does amazing, then maybe you open it up and you get that, you know, that highfalutin... <laughs> <laughs> narrator to read your book. Um, but so you're looking at the page right now, John. So why don't we get into some of the samples? Um, what do these AI narrators actually sound like? And I will admit I was pretty skeptical when I went into here because of the whole uncanny valley thing that I hear often with AI conversation. Apple did provide some samples. Just play one of them. It looks like this is Madison, a digital voice and reading a fiction romance. Uh, and it even says like a soprano voice. It was about the right age, but there was something different about her, about the way she carried herself. The bright aura that had always surrounded Allison was missing from this woman. And yet, there was something achingly familiar about her. Interesting to me that like that there's the the longer pauses, like sometimes when I think of AI narration, it's like they're rattling through the sentences. Maybe you get a little pause in between a period and, and the start of something. But like as as a performer, a narrator that is also performing, you know, that performer chooses sometimes to have a dramatic pause or something like that. It, like there, there were there was a pause right there that that narrator put in that seemed a little bit longer than the other ones. And yet beat. And then the next thing comes and things like that can go a long way. Play another one because they, they really are varied. This one. I is do know that there is an extraordinary sense here Mitchell. of caring and sharing and that the sharing includes a willingness to join in exercising crucial responsibility. This is enough for me. As the years add up, I find increasing good sense in falling back. When that sounds pretty darn doesn't solid take to me. me all the way like, I want to go on faith. Like that could be just a narrator confident. on a really great microphone. I mean, if I focus a little bit too deeply on it, um, all the sentences kind of start from the same area, you know, kind of, kind of in that register. So I could, I could pick nitpick it a little bit there, but these just sound a pretty solid play one more. Cause I think, I think this is really interesting. I looked up to find a wall of trees had materialized ahead of us. I hadn't noticed, because I'd been staring at my feet. I couldn't believe the fields actually had an end. Yeah, it was that further away a than I would have liked, but at least I, I now had something. But tangible. anyways, so the idea here is you've got all these different voices, and I don't know if these are the only voices that Apple's offering. I'm imagining they're gonna they're offering more, but depending on the content that you have. So are you offering a fiction, or did you author a fiction? Uh, is this self help? You know the type of book that you're writing and releasing 
this thought goes into, you know, who is reading the book? You know, is it the author? Does the author have the right voice? Often, you know, that's a really popular choice right now is having the author read their own book. That kind of gets around some of the obstacles. It's kind of like, well, you're the author, so you should be the one to, to voice it. But I've heard some really bad readings by authors. So there's that as well. But um, you don't want some like bright, peppy uh, AI voice you know, reading, uh, reading something that's really sad and and depressing, right? Like there's gotta be, there's gotta be some thought put into matching the voice with the content. So they have a couple of these offerings and, uh, and it's interesting to kind of hear the differences there. And I think altogether they kind of sound, you want to play moon, the last one. We would walk to the end of the beach to find our favorite constellation, the Pleiades. I know Bill carried within him deep currents of spiritual yearning that I mean, he found sounds pretty human to, to me. express. Yeah, I don't know. Beauty. You know what? Everybody's probably going to have a different opinion as far as whether this works for them long term, because it's, it's one thing to listen to a short clip. It's another thing to listen for 13 hours, like I said, or a 20 hour novel. Could you imagine? Um, at a certain point, do you just kind of like let it go and or you get used to it? Your ears adapt. I'm not quite sure. So, of course, everyone is saying right now, you know, all the a lot of the articles that I read, you know, is this the beginning of the end for human narrators? That's that's pulled directly from the Guardian piece that I linked to here. Um, it's certainly the beginning of something. <laughs> I don't know personally if it's the beginning of the end for human narrators, because, again, I think there's always room for a talented human uh, when compared to a robot or an AI that's driving something like, I don't think that human uh, artists are going away just because stable diffusion exists. You know, artists could use stable diffusion as a tool for themselves. What I see out of this is opportunity for independent um, authors and independent publishers. Like I really, I would love to be able to get in touch with a, uh, let's see here. Uh, Oh, see, so Dan Morin, uh, I reached out to Dan Morin. I'm only just now seeing that he replied. Uh, you should go over to sixcolors.com. Uh, Dan Morin wrote about this today and kind of shares his thoughts. Dan Morin, of course, frequent guest on the network and on this show, author of many uh, independent uh, books that he's that he's released and just a really talented author, but definitely not, you know, under the under the arm of the major book publishers. Right. Um, how do independent publishers feel or independent authors feel about the option to have, I'm assuming, a lower cost, uh, less time needed audiobook presentation of their book to just get it out there. And I, I have to imagine, and I have not read through, through his, um, his whole piece here. Um, and I'm really not that good at reading at while I'm talking at the same time. So I'm not going to do that, but everybody should check out his piece if you want to know how he feels about it. But, um, but it is just very interesting to me, the, the, the potential doors that something like this could open. I can understand people's fear and hesitation around something like this. But I mean, even if you're a talented narrator, like part of me is like, well, that's an extra avenue for you to explore. If I'm a talented narrator, People are hiring me because I'm good at reading these books for whatever reason. I've got a really nice voice. I know how to add in some dramatic um, inflections at the right moments. Um, it's just, I'm just pleasant to listen to. Whatever those things may be, a robotic representation of that same voice could exist simultaneously. And like I, as that talented narrator, could pick and choose my projects. Yes, I want to get paid more because I'm going to spend 40 some odd hours reading that book. Or no, I don't uh, want to read that book, uh, but I will absolutely license my voice to that book and still make money off of that book. Whereas otherwise it might've been an opportunity lost if I didn't have that opportunity. So I don't know if that's short-sighted, but that's kind of what comes to mind for me uh, is, you know, potentially down the line, this being an open avenue for narrators to make a little bit more money. Uh, of course it could go the opposite direction. And I think that's what people are are afraid of. Um, but I think there's fear around things we don't understand. And, you know, that I'm not even touching on the, uh, the kind of anti-competitive aspects of something like this with, you know, this is yet another, 
um, example of potentially a, a place for people who are really clamping down on anti-competitive behavior in big tech to look and say, oh, well, now Apple's you know cutting out the narrators and the, the people reading audiobooks with their systems. These systems, like you know, the, like in the previous interview. These systems are going to be created and they're going to be developed. So how do we move with them instead of against them? Um, and uh, who knows? Maybe one of these days somewhere down the line, you'll be watching a podcast on Twit and you'll hear the AI voice of Leo, Mike, Ant, and myself. May someday happen. I'm, I'd be really doubting that it happens anytime soon, though. And uh, I doubt it would happen uh, as anything more than an interesting experiment. But I could be wrong. So anyways... Fascinating stuff. Curious to see how that plays out. We have reached the end of this episode of Tech News Weekly. Thank you so much for watching and listening. We do this show every Thursday at twit.tv slash TNW. Go there and you can subscribe to the show in audio and video formats. Also, just want to mention real quick, uh, in the month of January, we do our Twit audience survey. This is the annual survey. It helps us to understand you, our audience, so that we can do the things that make your listening and viewing experience even better. So if you have opinions and you have a few minutes, go to twit.tv slash survey 23. That's twit.tv slash survey 23. Uh, and this goes through the end of the month. The earlier you do it, though, the more people we get it earlier then we might kind of reach our numbers and then not have to do it at the end of the month. So you never know. But anyways, we really appreciate you sharing your insight there. Also, if you want all of our shows without any ads, well, you can get that. Plus a whole bunch of other perks at uh, Club Twit, twit.tv slash Club Twit. You get all of our shows ad free. You get exclusive access to the Twit Plus feed with extra content. That's extra shows, not just pre and post show content, but extra shows in there as well. And a members only Discord channel, uh, which is just a lot of fun to participate in. That's twit.tv slash club twit, seven bucks per month. And you can uh, subscribe to individual shows on Apple Podcasts for $2.99 a month as well. If you don't want all the shows ad free, but you have one show that you want to support, I love T TNW. Uh, but I don't want ads, two ninety nine dollars a month, and you'll get the audio feed completely ad-free. If you want to follow me on the socials, you can find me at twit.social slash at Jason Howell. If you want to find me on Mastodon, uh, at Jason Howell on Twitter. I also do All About Android every Tuesday at twit.tv slash AAA. So check uh, me and my uh, co-host there uh, every Tuesday. And just want to thank everybody here, John Slanina, John Ashley, Burke McQuinn, everybody here at the studio who helps me do this show each and every week. Setting up this studio is no small feat. And thanks to you out there for watching and listening. And we will see you next week with Micah uh, on Tech News Weekly. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Hey, we should talk Linux. It's the operating system that runs the internet, a bunch of game consoles, cell phones, and maybe even the machine on your desk. But you already knew all that. What you may not know is that Twit now has a show dedicated to it, the Untitled Linux Show. Whether you're a Linux pro, a burgeoning sysadmin, or just curious what the big deal is, you should join us on the Club Twit Discord every Saturday afternoon for news, analysis, and tips to sharpen your Linux skills. And then make sure you subscribe to the Club Twit exclusive Untitled Linux Show. Wait, you're not a Club Twit member yet? Well, go to twit.tv slash club twit and sign up. Hope to see you there.